right. How's everybody doing today? As always, I'll give this a little bit of time here to make sure that people have time to come in and start watching. Hi, everybody. Yeah, <laughs> dream home photos. Got to get something here real quick. Hopefully everybody's uh, doing well with all this stuff that's going on and everything. Just incredible. Some of the things are happening right now. Definitely a time to be to be praying about all that's going on. All right. Good. Okay. All right. Let's get started. Today I'm going to talk about why I am not into primitive survival. Okay. Uh, primitive survival stuff. You see these videos and things here on YouTube and and they they do these you'll see this stuff here the survival challenge can go out into the woods and can you survive for so many days and you know these uh, reality TV shows and all this other stuff and and I just I need to make a statement about this um, on the issue of off-grid living and how it relates to this type of movement here because there's a lot of um, false hope so to speak, for people, young people especially, <clears throat> that you could actually, if things get really bad, you can go out into the woods and you can build something like this and you'll be fine. Um, it doesn't work that way. Okay, and I'm going to be talking about that in today's video. Uh, it's this stuff here is okay, you know, just for a little adventure thing, uh, exciting. Hey, I got to build a stick shelter and I slept in it overnight. Sure. But uh, this isn't what you do if you buy property somewhere. You don't build one of these little shelter things, and, and it just doesn't work. <laughs> and I'll explain some of the reasons for that. Um, <clears throat> primitive survival. Primitive survival uh, should actually start as common sense. You know, your primitive survival thing here that's in your mind that God gave you, you should be able to look at the situation in the world and say, okay, um, if there's war coming to my country, I should probably leave a town or a city or whatever else, and I should probably get someplace that's safer. You know, um, that's just a, a simple survival skill that should be there in your mind. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of these people, you know, this one in particular right here, this is the Survival Lily ch channel on YouTube. Um, and there's others like her. I'm not picking on her per se, but there's a lot of these people. They'll go out. They do this survival challenge thing. They build a stick shelter. They live. You know, they'll do all these crazy adventure things, and then they go back to the city, and they live in the city. And I just think you're really kind of missing the whole point here. Um, I mean, how many of these people? They're showing you how to build stick shelters and all the survival goody stuff. If you know, when the stuff hits the fan or the end of the world as we know it. And yet, when the lockdowns happen, they're stuck in the city. What happened to your survival challenges? What happened to going out and building your stick shelter and living in it while everything else is falling apart? We'll see it didn't work. And that's why I'm saying this is a false hope that a lot of people have. This is not off-grid. Okay, I just want you to understand that. Off-grid is not this roughing, it, you know, you're sleeping in some little hole in the ground with leaves covering you for the night. Okay, that's... You're not going to last very long if you do that. Um, 
in a, in a real survival situation, you have no other choice. Okay, maybe, but um, <clears throat> I will explain <clears throat> my experiences with some of this type of stuff. Um, uh, another thing I want to talk about. Well, I, I'll I'll say this, and then we'll get back into some of the detail of what I would recommend here. Um, another thing that goes along with a lot of this mindset is. They do this thing of the uh, bug out bags and survival gear and everything. Um, a lot of it is stuff that's just junk. I mean, when I first met my wife, she was kind of green on some of this stuff. She didn't really understand it. Um, and she bought a couple of these, you know, um, you know, survival bag things or whatever, some survival website. And it was all just the, the typical junk, the space blanket, the um, little tent thing, the tube tent thing, uh, water purification tablets, uh, the little bar of food stuff that you can eat that's not really food. It's just absolutely terrible. Um, you know, and all the little things like that, you know, the, the pencil that can write on the pad and the pad, you know, you can write, write on it when it's raining and then and the little glow sticks and the, the little wind up radio flashlight thing. And, all that stuff and it's all you know hey things are falling apart there's war coming there's a hurricane there's whatever go on out and build your stick shelter and things and then you'll be you'll be fine and get through the night no you won't okay i'm just i have to warn about this stuff um like i said uh a lot of experience that i've had over the years i've been in a lot of different off-grid situations from you know, the East Coast to the West Coast, Montana, up into Alaska, down into Central America. I've seen a lot of different things uh, down in the Appalachian Mountains. I've known how people, you know, live off grid. And this type of stuff right here is really not going to really protect you for very long. Um, and again, this is more of a, you know, the scary you're living out in nature, you're surviving and everything, or I shouldn't say living out in nature, but you're out there and it's, you have to survive this whatever thing in your stick shelter. That's, that's not the way it is when you're off grid. You know, it's not some kind of a scary place. It's more like your living room. You get up in the morning, you go for a walk on your property or you, you, you know, you go check on the berries or you go check on this or you check on that. You know, it's not this, Oh, I have to survive. And what's those noises out here at night and things? It's it's a different mindset. And I'll be talking about that as we continue in this. Um, so, uh, but according to the one guy, there's one guy, a false prophet out there that, uh, well, I shouldn't call him a false prophet. He's just a, I, I remove my statement of false prophet. <laughs> he might be, I don't know. But um, this guy is just a desperate attention seeking little jerk and um i'll show you this this is this shows you that it, the desperation to which this guy goes to here um his uh article he did about me and and he's you know takes a little screenshot of my wife where she's being sarcastic and puts it there and then uh, there's uh, brother jacob thompson and and um there's me i guess on the on this this uh um stump thing there and there I have a thing on my head and there's a shelter that I'm supposedly making, I guess, out on my property property or I mean, desperate. And this guy claims to be a Bible believing Christian. So I just I had to show that just funny. I'm not even into bushcraft survival stuff. So. But what good is the truth? You know, if you're a crazy nut, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> OK. Let me explain the difference between this and I'll show you one here. This guy right here, right? This is a, a good channel, the main woods here. He puts out some really good stuff. And um, this video is a really neat video. He goes over this guy here, Camille Below, I think his name is there, um, 1917 to 2006. This guy's an old timer um, up in the St. John River area, which is up far north of uh, Maine. It's a lot farther north than we're at. And um, just the, the way that the guy lived and was just amazing. 
and I've I've studied looked into the lives of some of these these main guides, especially the guys from the early 1900s. Um, a big one around here that we know about is Al Nugent, Alan Patty Nugent, and um, Al Nugent is just a legendary, you know, man. And the stuff that the guy did, um, you know, I've heard some of the stories. There's actually the Patton's Lumberman's Museum over this way here in the town of Patton, and um, they actually have a snowmobile that he built out of an old motorcycle. And he, before snowmobiles were even really designed, he designed his own kind of a tracked snow machine. Just amazing, the stuff that the guy could do. And these guys weren't going around with the primitive survival type of thing. They, they had their gear, they would go and they would, they would do trap lines, they would trap animals. And um, these guys were just incredible. I love to hear the stories of them. They were, you know, real men. And a lot of times they had the navigational abilities of these old timers. They didn't use compasses. They didn't use maps. They just, they could kind of figure out where they're going and, and go in that direction. And I have a little bit of that ability. Um, just from, you know, as a little boy, I would be out in the woods and everything a lot. And, you know, we didn't have, you know, we had six and a half acres, but we were connected to, I don't even know how many acres, um, maybe a thousand, 2000 acres or something. It was a pretty big area um, down in Pennsylvania where I grew up. It was a big forest. You get back in there and nobody, you never saw anybody back in the woods like that. And, and so I just was exploring all the time growing up and um, I never got lost. I just never did. I never had a compass, never had a maps or anything else. I get turned around sometimes, but then it was just sort of, okay, stop, think, where you're at here, that's the direction that you go. And but um, I'll say a little bit more about some of the stories of my experiences growing up. But if you hear, if you watch this video, you'll see this guy, um, you know, built this log cabin, and he's living out there with his children, and um, just amazing. You know, hunting, fishing, foraging, the whole thing, which I'll be talking about in the next seminar, um, uh, because that's an important part of being off grid <clears throat> is being able to get food from your property or from your local area um but these guys were incredible and this all this stick shelter stuff this you know this kind of thing here just didn't see these guys doing that um unless it was some kind of a major i don't know why they would even have the uh, reason to build something i've never built anything like this in all my times of being in the woods but uh <clears throat> i'll just tell you some of my experiences to show you why I'm not into primitive survival. Um, when I was a boy, I did get lost one time. And <laughs> this is an embarrassing story for me, but I was really young. I was about four or five years old. And my brothers and sisters took me down in the woods, way back down in, there was a, a little stream down there that we call the Springs. I talked about that in another video. And they left me down there. I mean, a four-year-old boy, I think I was about four. If I remember correctly, I remember some parts of this, but I remember them running off and they left me down there and I'm thinking, OK, how do I get home? So I just kind of I think it's that way. And I started walking. I got way off of our trail. I didn't have a clue where I was going. And um, I remember I got up and I could I got I could figure out where the field was at. There was an Amishman that had a field that was kind of bordered the woods that went back into where I lived. And so I kind of, I went, I missed where the trail was going up to our house and I went way down and then came out near this field, but it was really this huge, big thorn patch, you know, briars, we call them, but, you know, and really bad. And, and so I, you know, even as a four-year-old boy, I had that sense of direction of where to go and I need to go up a hill and I had to kind of head this way. I couldn't have told you that, you know, it's North, East, Southwest, whatever, but I headed up in there and I remember I got stuck in this. You know, really bad thorn patch and you know it was sticking to my clothes and everything and then i remembered my survival training here uh <laughs> there's the embarrassing part um and i remember reading the my mother reading the story of peter rabbit and what happened when he got his his vest caught his clothes caught well he just slipped out of it and took off and so in my little four-year-old brain i thought well there's the solution so i took my clothes off right there in that briar patch because they were sticking to the briars and I got through the briar patch and I walked up through the field and walked up to the house and walked in and, and everybody's what in the world, where are your clothes at? Well, 
I made it home. But uh, that's my first survival story there. Uh, four years old, what can you do? But um, it just, I have, you know, I've never had a problem with it in terms of getting really badly lost and I have to build a stick shelter or something, I have this primitive survival thing. And what I'm saying is, I'm going to try to impart some of the things I've learned over the years. Um, when you go into the woods, first of all, look at the time that you're going in. If it's really late in the evening, don't go very far, right? Make sure that you're taking, uh, you know, you're taking mental um, pictures, so to speak, where you look and you say, okay, I can see I'm walking in this way. It does go down a little bit of a hill. So that way, the reverse of that is you go up the hill. You know, you just kind of notice your surroundings and things. And if it's late at night, like I said, don't go very far. Um, okay, it's a good day. I'm going to go out. I'm going to take a big hike. Well, think about where you're going and how to get back again. You know, keep your thoughts about you. Um, you know, there's a lot of things like that. Uh, another story, I was deer hunting the one time, went to a friend's cabin. I was not familiar with the area. And I went down, there was a pipeline, and I hiked down the pipeline, and I uh, saw some signs of deer, you know, and I thought, hey, I'm going to head back in through the woods and see if they're back in there. It's kind of a thick mountain laurel down in Pennsylvania. They have mountain laurel. Uh, it's kind of an evergreen, you know, uh, deciduous type of little shrub tree thing. And it's actually the state flower. But anyhow, so I, I saw that and I started to head back into the woods and I got all mixed around and turned around and everything else. And I thought, OK, well, I just I remember I was walking around and you come back to the same spot. And you're like, oh, nuts. Yeah, I remember this spot. OK, well, I never consider it to be lost. It's never a matter of, oh, no, I'm lost, you know, and never had a cell phone this whole time. Um so I just couldn't call for somebody and send the you know helicopters to come rescue me or something. No, you just have to work your way out and get out of that situation. So I just kind of stopped and I thought, okay, well, some survival advice. You know, there's a little stream over there. Well, if I was really desperate, you follow a stream, the stream will eventually lead to a town every single time. It'll lead to a river or to some other kind of a thing. And eventually it will lead to some kind of civilization of some kind if you're really desperate. I wasn't really desperate. So I thought, well, okay, I'm going to cross over this little stream. It's, you know, that would be down in the valley of where I was at before I crossed into the woods. And so I'll just head up this other ridge and I'll just see if I can get up and see where I'm, see if there's an area where I can see a little bit better. So I started hiking out and I looked over and I could see as I was hiking up this one big hill, I looked over and I could see kind of uh, the trees. So sort of, it's not just like this with trees and trees and trees. It's you can see the trees and clear sky behind it. And I thought, oh, there's an opening over there. So start hiking towards the opening. And sure enough, right there is the pipeline. Walked out onto the pipeline, looked way over, and oh, man, I'm way far away from my friend's cabin because his cabin was off the pipeline, you know, back in the woods off the pipeline. You had to drive up through the pipeline to get to his cabin. And it was way up on top of the one ridge, and I was way over on another ridge. And it was just kind of, all right, well, whatever. And so I started hiking back the pipeline. I had to go through some guy's property, and he came out in his truck or whatever else. And I, by that time, I was already through it. And I thought, well, I'm not going to, I don't get, need to talk to the guy. I'm just heading up. I'm not sorry I trespassed on your land, whatever. Um, but, you know, I ended up getting back after dark, and, and my friend was really worried. And he was, you know, where in the world were you at? And I said, oh, I got a little bit mixed around. You know, um, I didn't think, in other words, oh, I, I'm going to be out here at night. Um, I mean, it was dark till I got back. And I, but I never thought, it never even occurred to me, I should stop and build a fire and build a stick shelter. It never even occurred to me. Um, it's just, you know, my friend's cabin's over there. I'm cold right now. I'm hungry. You know, I'm not going to try to trap a rabbit with a snare or something and build a stick shelter and a fire and cook. No, it's just I need to get back there. Um, it's hard work and whatever else, you know, I, OK, I'm going to suffer a little bit. Big deal. Go back there. And you know, that's where the cabin's at. And I'm saying that as a, as a way to say a lot of people, this is their hope. 
they're thinking to themselves, hey, I things break down, I can just run out into the woods, build a stick shelter, and I'll be out there for a week or two, and then I can go right back to my life. No, you can't. You, well, you might be able to, but maybe you can't. That's why I'm saying if you're thinking of going off grid, you have to really change your way of thinking up here. Um, like I said, all throughout these, this whole seminar, off grid is 90% here and 10% here. It's you could be the strongest physical bodied man out there, and if you don't have the right mindset, you're not going to make it. And you can be a scrawny little, you know, very petite woman, and you could go out there and do just great because you enjoy what you're doing. You enjoy the whole lifestyle out there. So another story, um, our property that we have, um, I've walked over a lot of it, um, not the whole thing. Um, it's a pretty big property. And the, it's, the north border is easy to figure out. The uh, west border, pretty easy. South border is pretty easy. The east border of our property, I cannot get that thing figured out in my head. I just, I go back in there and my head gets all mixed up because there's old logging roads and they go and they, they head over towards my neighbor's property and some of them continue over into their property. And so, you know, our property had been logged, his property hasn't. So, you know, it would normally be, well, there are big trees on this side, smaller trees on this side, the smaller ones are mine and the bigger ones are his. But there's a couple areas where it crosses and it, it it just gets my head all mixed up. Well, we were snowshoeing about well last winter, and I was trying to figure my way back and through there and trying to figure where the you know property line was, and I got uh, over onto my neighbor's property and actually crossed his property and onto another neighbor's property, and I got over there and I'm, I look and I see this house over through the woods and I thought. And I'm just totally disoriented. I'm thinking, is there a house on my property <laughs> that I didn't know about? And I thought, no. And, it, it, and I thought, I'm still on my property, aren't I? And, and figured out, no, wait, that's my neighbor's property. That's, that's it's his house. What am I? Man, I got really mixed up. And so we backtracked and went back, and I started heading in a different direction. And and I was getting all mixed up on that border of the property. Again, there was no stick shelter. I didn't build a stick shelter. <laughs> it's just you know, it was getting later and you know, it was my, me and my wife and my son. And they're saying, you know, which way should we go? And no compass, no cell phone to call for help or anything else. And I said, okay, just stop here for a minute. Looked at my watch. Okay. It's getting, we have probably, probably about two hours yet before the sun sets. So the sun's going over that way. So that way has to be West. And I'm thinking, well, okay, well, I know I need to go West. So we'll just kind of head Southwest till we hit our southern border because I know what the one on other property looks like. So we just did that. Got over to the southern border. As soon as we hit the southern border, we just had headed, headed straight west, followed the southern border to the west till we got to one of our trails, got on the trail and went home. And again it was it was almost dark till we got there, but it didn't matter. There's no need for this, you know, primitive survival skill thing of building a stick shelter. It's just to me, it's a waste of time. Um, the real thing is being off grid, um, going out there and saying this is not going to last you for a whole year. Okay, some little thing here, and you can get in there and whatever. You're going to live in that for a year. You know why waste your time on something like that? My opinion. If if you want to get into the bushcraft thing and primitive survival skills and whatever, okay, but. I just think it gives a lot of people a false hope and you know so that's that's a something i just needed to say as part of this whole thing because um i don't want people to be deceived into thinking that you can somehow you know going out into the woods and whatever else it's a scary thing and and you can go out and you can build this type of shelter and then you'll be just fine and you can stay in it for some long amount of time that's just not true so, um, and another thing, as far as the survival thing, uh, this whole deal of what would happen if you're out in the middle of nowhere and, and, you know, you don't, you die or something out there. Well, that's not really scary to me. Um, as a Christian, I know I'm going to go to heaven when I die. So that 
puts a different spin on it for me. Maybe some other people that are lost and they don't know the Lord, they don't know where they're going to go um, when they die. Well, maybe for them it would be scary. But for me, it's not really a big deal. But uh, so, you know, off-grid mindset, small and sustainable, but uh, not that small, okay? Not this survival stuff. Um, you have to, you know, I know that some of you have asked the thing of how do you um, talk a wife into going out and, and living off grid? Well, this is not the way to do it right here. You know, hey, come on, look at this little stick shelter or this little box or something like that. Uh, and this is where we're going to live for the next you know, couple months. No, no. And I don't care how tough a guy you are living in something like that for an uh, extended amount of time you're not going to like it. You're not going to be happy. You need to have uh, some beauty there, some neat things there, some comforts, and that's how you make it off grid. Um, again, this guy here, um, this Camille Belou guy, um, this the guy that has this channel here, he actually um, helped to fix up his cabin, this older man's cabin here. I'll just show you if I can get to the one part. Okay, right there you can see the wood stove. And um, he has a little, you know, collared glass panes in his window. Now, why do you need that if you're off grid? If you're just out there to survive, whatever, you don't. But it looks pretty. It's nice. It's a neat little thing. That's the point I'm trying to make. He's raising his children in this little cabin out in the wilderness someplace. Well, yeah, you have the beauty of the outdoors and the beauty of the nature and everything else, but have a neat little thing in there like that. Have some nice little decorations or whatever. Do some special things. It, it isn't some kind of a deal where you go off grid and you're just, like I said, living in this cruddy little shelter or something like that. Like, you know, that, that thing about me with the, John Davis over in the UK, you know, that it's some little thatched hut or something that we live in. No, we don't. I mean, you know, the, see if I can find the one video. Um, we actually have a, there's some really neat things about our off grid tiny house. And um, this, let me get back here real quick. I'll just put this thing over here quick. Like this. Okay. Right there. This one here. That's on our land. You know, it's beautiful property there in the wintertime. Again, there's another one from our land. Here, here, and here. You can kind of see those. I'm sorry, it's not really all that close up or whatever. Um, this is a study right here where you can the tongue and groove pine right there that's the inside of our tiny house um another one on our land another one there on the land another one on the land um here's another one right there inside of our tiny house uh, we have a whiteboard in there so you know you don't have to this thing like this this primitive survival i just I just want to tell people it doesn't if you're thinking that this is your hope for the future and whatever else it's not going to work you're not going to be able to make it with that so uh and you know as far as you study early settlers um a lot of the early settlers they would build a small little log home very much like this you know this guy here that kind of a log home you build that a small little place and then you have a place to stay in while you're building your actual home out of stone or whatever else you know sawing your lumber for your actual house and um, so the log home thing um, it's it, if you actually study the history of log homes log homes were just kind of uh, like modern day tiny homes or modern day uh, mobile homes or whatever else they were never intended as a the final place. Now you get these huge big log mansions and whatever else, and it's terrible to heat those places. Um, 
especially the kit log homes, a lot of those that makes the logs really small. They don't really work all that great uh, for up north here, but you know, um, log homes were originally just a temporary type of a thing, but they didn't build stick shelters. So just wanted to put that together. I know there's some younger people that are watching this off grid seminar and it can be appealing, you know, and you think to yourself this, you know, stick shelter stuff. And, oh man, I can just, I can go out there and I could do that. I think I could do that in some park or whatever else, or try to go out into the wilderness. You'd be miserable in it. And so just take it from um, somebody who has experience with this whole thing. And I have camped in tents and I have done the jungle hammock thing. And that was miserable. Um, I have done some of this type of stuff and it's not fun. So, I mean, even as a boy, I was building, I built two different tree houses and they weren't stick shelters. They actually had, you know, walls and a roof and, you know, windows and everything. So, but, um, so I guess we can go to question and answers now. I'll keep that up because it's a, I'll do it this way. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, thoughts on the whole primitive survival thing or whatever else, let's go ahead and ask some questions. Good question. Question. What about the Indian teepee? Yeah, there's a, a lot of good things to that. Um, you know, you can survive in one of those. They're very similar. There's there's different types of sort of tent dwellings that are good for the north. Um, one would be the teepee, um, the very familiar Indian teepee that kind of goes up, you know, and it's round. Uh, another one would be the Mongolian yurt. Um, those work pretty good from what I've heard. Uh, wall tents, a canvas wall tent. We had one of those. Um, they do work pretty good. The only problem is with a wall tent and all the other tent type of things, you have to be careful about snow loads getting on them. But I mean, you get people in northern Siberia and they have they set up tents and they put multiple layers of hide on the on the things. And and um, you know, even with that, even with them having you know they're out there and the you know, Siberia, you know, going after reindeer and everything, hurting the reindeer and whatnot. Even with that, they still, the women still make it look really pretty and, and whatever else. And they make it, you know, they, they decorate it and make it look pretty ornate because that actually helps to lift the mood and, and things. Um, kind of like the, the stained glass right there. Have a little stained glass window in your cabin. Um, it helps with just elevating your mood. Question, what about Dan Price? Check his video on YouTube. Not real familiar with him. Um, uh, how can I get in contact with you on Skype? Well, I don't I, I don't do the this to say this publicly because I haven't really talked about this in a long time, but I don't really put out a lot of contact information. Um, not because I don't want to talk to people. It's just that we get a lot of people contacting us. I had to uh, make my email, take my email down years ago because it was, we were getting 400, 450 emails a day, something like that. And that was back before the channel was even that big. So, um, you know, Skype and, and things, it's very difficult, um, you know, to answer as many people as we have to deal with. So, um, what's the, the point of going off grid if you're in a big house? Does that kind of blow your cover of off grid? Yeah, it does. Um, if you have a big house, I mean, you can actually put, um, you know, do some off grid type of stuff in a bigger house. In other words, just in the winter time, just only heat up the kitchen and the bathroom or whatever else with a wood stove. The rest of the house can be cooler as long as you don't have water pipes going throughout the rest of the house. But yeah, I mean, if you have some property and it's got some big, huge mansion on it, you know, oh, we're off grid now. I don't know. Um, 
I think you need to separate temporary shelter against permanent shelter. Nothing is wrong with being able to survive an emergencies war. Uh, yeah, that's, you know, I was trying to, I guess I didn't say that per se, but yeah, temporary type of thing, okay, maybe, but um, yeah. Question, how would mail work? Can you set up your own mailbox when, of course, you're far away just on land and without an address? Um, what you can do is as long as the town, um, is, if you're in, uh, as long as the town recognizes your property as an actual, like a, that there would be an, a number to your property there, um, you can get a, a post office box. And so if you have a post office box, they just bring all your mail right to there and then you just go into town and pick it up. Um, that's what most people do around here. Um, um, question, how can I get in contact with Brother JT? I am in Illinois and looking for fellowship. Um, I think you can probably contact him through his website. Uh, Um, looking for a bit of guidance brethren found this nice little website selling cheap arched cabin kits near me would these be easy to heat sorry in advance if, if it's a dumb question uh not sure what they would look like or anything arched cabin kits i'm not you mean like an a-frame or i'm not really sure um i know the amish a lot of amish in, the, in throughout the country they're building these little cabins and whatever else, and they build them very cheaply. Um, they would work in some ways, but they're they're built pretty cheap. You have to be careful of that. Um, I think the panic behavior is dangerous to being off-grid. You should be excited about it. Yeah, that's true. Question, how can we tell if it's a good place to live? How do we find places that are good to live with people that are like-minded? We really want to find a like-minded community and know our neighbors. Um, well, at the, again, you're going to run into different things with different areas. Down south, it's, they're going to be a lot more friendly. Up north, they'll be a little bit more standoffish from my experience. Um, and, you know, a good place to live, uh, the warm climate versus uh, cold climate did that study the other day and again that will influence your decision there um, I mean you can go to a if you find out if there's a local town like a little fair or a, um, something like that that's a good thing to go to um, you know any kind of museum or any kind of a thing that would be like a community event where people would be coming together and go there and just kind of you know hang out around the people and get to talking to some of them, strike up a conversation with them. Um, a lot of times you might even find somebody in that kind of a situation would say, you know, you'd say, oh, we'd love to move to an area like this. It's beautiful. We'd, we'd like to you know, maybe even do the off grid thing and whatever. Do you know of any cabins in the area that would be for sale or something? And you might even get somebody that would say, oh, hey, yeah, we have one. It's not advertised, but we've been thinking about selling it. And, you know, you, if you want, you can come check it out. You never know. Question, would a small rural village in Mexico that's 20 minutes from a 47,000 population center, I guess, be considered off-grid? Sorry, I'm new to the understanding. Um, well, if off-grid is typically understood to be that's not connected to the power grid, and so you'd have to be dependent on having no electricity, like this place right here that I'm showing the picture of there's no electricity there's no light bulbs or anything else and this is while he was fixing up too by the way so don't think oh i can see light through the cracks there in the wall so that must mean that that's how you have to live no it's just that the chinking in between the logs fell out so just to clear that up um but yeah i mean if you don't have to be in the in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness area or something like that to be considered off-grid um
find an, an old barn, fix inside, live in, leave the outside like old barn, save on property taxes. Yeah, you could do that. That'd be another good way to do it. Um, a lot of the old barns, if you can find an old one that's timber framed, like a post and beam is another way that they say it. Um, they're very solid, extremely solid. And you could definitely fix up a small area of it and then, you know, build on and whatever else inside, I'm saying expand. Um, it's a very smart thing to do, actually. Um, I think the first thing about moving off grid is to scope out the area for job opportunities and some way to use your skills to make an income. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Anybody else have any other questions? Question, the only option in the Netherlands is living on a boat. How do you feel about that? Nature is not free to live in for is here. God bless you. Um, oops. Uh, um, yeah, you know, living on a boat. I used to actually build houseboats, so... Um, yeah, it's definitely, it's doable. I know that they have those long boat things over in the UK. I thought that was pretty fascinating. And you can, you know, just move when you need to. It's kind of neat. Um, yeah, I think that living on a boat would be great. Absolutely. Um, how many acres do you have for your current property? And does it have what you need in terms of lumber, firewood, gravel, other? And what year did you come to Maine? Um, not going to say how much land I have uh, because it's, you know, people wouldn't understand that as far as the, the size of the land and everything else. Um, it just, you know, it's a good amount of land. Uh, it's not as big as some in the area that I've met, but it's a, it's a decent property. We were kind of shocked that we even got it. Um, but it's, you know, it's a big property and we got it pretty cheap because of it being logged. Um, and as far as firewood is concerned, yeah, we have plenty of firewood around because of the logging damage to a lot of the birch trees and, and things. And the beech trees are just, you know, the whole thing that that uh, whatever disease thing that they get, we have a lot of that. We're actually doing some logging on that. Um, as far as lumber for building, um, we're, we have a decent some decent stands of balsam fir and some spruce. But it's they're not huge right now. Um, so uh, we came to Maine in 2013 is when we first bought uh, land here in Maine. And then we moved in January of 2014. We were on grid at that point in time. Um, but yeah, we we. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's basically it, I think, answer your question there. Um, Question, we have to be out of our place in six days. I have been working on a camper. Should we just go live in that for a bit on someone's property? Please pray for us as we don't know what to do. Um, yeah, you know, I think that that would be a smart thing to do. Um, I, I, again, I can't really answer the question because I don't really know all the details of the situation. And you just have to pray about it. You know, um, living in a camper and try if you can find somebody that they would say hey yeah come live on our property and it's the weather's mild enough that you're you know not able to or that you're not going to freeze or something like that well then okay do that yeah um so Um, question, how are you doing after your last video about your father? I've been praying for you and your family. I'm doing all right. It's, it's been, a, you know, I, again, I had a couple of people rebuke me in the comments and they said, why would you bring that out? It's just gossip. No, it's just, it, it was covered up by my dad. I'm, now that I found out, 
I'm not going to continue the family cover-up of what happened. I'm just not going to do that. I'm not trying to bring shame on my dad or whatever else like that. No, it's just that there's, it's, don't, I was just trying to say it in a way that people, hey, if you're going to mess around, it will come out eventually. You know, um, don't cover up sin is what I was trying to say by the whole thing there. So, and, you know, it, it just, it takes me off. It wasn't just my dad. It was my grandparents that were involved. It was also the Mennonite family that adopted my half brother, you know, and they kept it secret from him. You know, just this organized, stinking organized religion. They just, oh, this sin, oh, let's not talk about it. Let's just cover everything up. It's terrible. And I'm not going to have a part of it. I don't cover things up. Please take him out. Come on, take him out. Dogs over here whining at the door. Um, how long did it take you to build your off grid house? Just curious. Uh, well, I don't have an off-grid house. <laughs> uh, we have a tiny home, um, and that did not take that long. Um, it was pretty quick, actually. Fairly easy to build um, because it's already, a, you know, it's what I said about my one video about the recycled housing. It's just a matter of building some walls and, you know, um, insulating a few things and whatever else, putting a, a wood stove in and whatever. So. Will you, will you or have you tried to share gospel with your half brother? I haven't met him yet. I don't know if I ever will. I have no idea. He's down in Pennsylvania, and I'm not going to be going down anytime soon. So I have no idea. I mean, it's just literally what two, three months now that I've even, you know, that he showed up and made himself known to our family. Um, so I have no idea what the future is there. None. Question off topic, is the man of sin in the translator's letter to King James the same as the beast in Revelation 13.3, both having wounds? Um, no, it's actually talking about the Pope, is what they were talking about in their, you know, introductory thing there in the King James Bible. Um, Question, what do you think about underground houses? I hear good things about them in theory, but never actually saw someone living in one. Um, I've never, never actually been in one, like a really real underground house, but it's, um, uh, they, they do have some definite positives to them. I've, I have looked into it a little bit. I have a few books on them. I've read some books on them and things. So it's interesting, definitely an interesting thing. Um, question the type of off-grid house will depend upon the country yeah it can yeah you know if, if I talk too much about where we live and our actual property and everything else um, people start to make trouble and whatever else too, you know, so I've already had people on YouTube that have brought out the location of our land that we have and there, you know, it's just, you know, it, it's irritating. So. Does anybody else have any other questions? Right now, our biggest issue with our property in terms of timber is um, the popple that we have, uh, it's, or quaking aspen, to, you can call it either one. Um, but uh, there, we have so many of them in some areas, it's just really thick with those. So I've been trying to go through and thin out some of those stands and, and whatever else, because we can use the long, skinny you know, popple when they're dried out. Um, they burn pretty good in our rocket stove, one rocket stove that we have here actually at this place. So I um, was doing that a lot this uh, summer. So Is 
So Okay, what do you recommend for a off-grid medical kit? Um, well, just the same thing that you would have on-grid, really. I mean, we don't use a lot of the, like, neosporin or anything like that. We use a dried yarrow powder. We can use balsam fir sap. We can use, you know, coconut oil. You can use, there's a bunch of things. We just, just natural health type of ways to heal wounds and whatever else, but we don't really have any kind of thing that's different than anybody that would be on grid in terms of that. So. But, you know, if you're a younger person and you really want to learn how to um, navigate through the wilderness and not wilderness, but just through the woods and whatever else, Hunting is a really good thing to get into. Um, and, you know, you go fishing and whatever. Um, and you'll get to know the woods very well like that. Again, that's how I learned. Uh, just being able to walk through the woods and, and you get the sense of direction and everything. And um, my son has it as well. Um, even when he was a boy, he would, uh, a couple times he wandered off on our property when we first bought it. He was only three years old when we first bought our land and um and you know different times i'd be working or doing whatever my wife and i'd be working building things and you know look around and where's oliver at oh great where did he go he wandered off someplace and he'd you know we'd see him coming back and around some other trail or whatever else and he'd figure his way back you know just as a little boy so um He's been really good at that. He has a bicycle. They, they call it a, a push bike or something. I forget what they call, but it doesn't have pedals. He's had it since he was three years old. Bought it for his three-year-old birthday. And and it has, you can get the little black skis that go on the thing. And um, you can put the wheels down in and you strap them into these skis. And so he can go on top of the snow that way. And, and I remember as a, a three, no, he would have been four no, actually, no, he would have been three when he, okay, I was thinking of that winter, but yeah, it was when he was three, and um, he would get on on top of the snow, and he went so far back into the one part of our property, we could barely even see him anymore, and, you know, just finally turned around, I, I couldn't call back to him, he was way back in, and finally he just turned around and, you know, made his way back up to us again, <laughs> so, um you just, you get out in nature, you're not afraid of it, it's, you know, you have to keep your wits about you, you, you know, you won't get lost, you don't need to build some kind of survival thing and whatever, so. Um, how to start a fire with kindling? Kindling is what I think the word you're looking for, K-I-N-D-L-I-N-G. Um, it's just smaller version of split fire what is what it is and um you can do that uh, birch bark works really good off of trees um there's a lot of different things that you can use to start a fire um okay i'll answer this one here but uh Question, can you please explain the Antichrist? I know it has nothing to do with off-grid, but you are a brother of great teaching, and I feel I may not have the right understanding. God bless. The Antichrist is going to be a physical man. The Reformed theology teaches that the Antichrist is a system, the papal system, and that every pope is an Antichrist, an Antichrist, but there is no such thing as the Antichrist. Well, that's not true. It's a man that comes in the future, claiming basically to be Jesus Christ, and he will rule over the whole world, the world's going to worship him, they're going to use all the media and everything else um, to really make him look like he's God, and it's going to be a bad time, he will be the head of the Catholic Church, um, that's what the Bible teaches, I'm not just, you know, Catholic bashing here or something like that, but uh, that's just what the Bible teaches, so 
um, and there will be a mark that will be required to show allegiance to him and to be part of his smart technology system. So um, I think we're a few years away from it, but it's approaching. Question, what do you think about horses? Great investment if you have grazing land. We actually plan on getting horses at some point in time. Um, we just need to get a few things figured out in terms of uh, our property and whatever. Right now we're dealing with thieves. Um, which is really ticking me off and because I think that they must watch us here or something like that when we're down in town then they'll hit our property and it's making me mad. Um, so I'm going to be doing some more things to catch them in the future. I'm not going to say a whole lot more. Again, that's another reason why, you know, I appreciate the fact how much land do you have just as a normal, it's a good question, but I just, I can't say a whole lot online about the location of the land and whatever else just can't do it um um question not exactly today's topic but never heard you talk about this do you have plans to build a greenhouse to extend growing season are you going to cover this topic at all uh no we're not really no plans to build a greenhouse or anything right now um we, we don't really do that. Um, actually, I bought a one of these cheap uh, greenhouse types of things to dry out some firewood. The one time I thought I'll just st uh, stack some firewood inside this thing. I tried reinforcing it and whatever else. We got one big windstorm up where we're at. We get some pretty heavy wind because we're up pretty high. And uh, it's flat in the stupid <laughs> Chinese-made greenhouse. So that was it for that. Um, so, yeah. So, okay, well, anybody have any other questions relating to today's topic about primitive survival and versus off-grid and whatever else? This is one of those things that's not a really big important thing with off-grid living. I just wanted to get this out there for younger people that might be confused about the two. Um, the remaining ones are a little bit more uh, important here. Um, but uh, the one for Monday, because today will be last for this week, the one for Monday is going to be uh, the subject of growing food, raising food, and finding food. Some things to think about there. Then we'll have just going to be four days next week and that will be it so um, can you tell me what kind of music you listen to and can you uh, make any recommendations well uh, that would be a whole other video um, we like bluegrass music, old bluegrass music, um, classical music, uh, hymns, instrumental hymns. Um, uh, there's a London Symphony Orchestra, I think it is, uh, Hymns Triumphant. That's really good. Uh, CDs, very good. Um, very good music. So, um, all right, well, that's going to be it. Thank you to everybody out there for watching. Thank you for your questions. And uh, like I said, Monday we'll be back with uh, growing food, raising food, and finding food. And then we'll have after that will be the uh, number 12 will be the terrible toilet. Uh, number 13 will be how to fail at off-grid living. And then number 14 will be the future of old pads living. So it should be interesting. Um, so that will be it and thank you to everybody out there for watching and we will see you in the next week the four final parts of the off-grid seminar